This is Office Hours at Duke University. Today's conversation is with Mark Anthony Neal. Professor Neal teaches at Duke's Department of African and African American Studies. He is the author of four books, including New Black Man, Rethinking Black Masculinity. He wrote the main essay for the 3D CD compilation, Hello World, the complete Motown solo collection. His blog is called New Black Man. This semester, he is teaching two courses here at Duke, Spike Lee and the New Black Aesthetic, and Rhythm and Autobiography. Viewers can join this Duke Office Hours conversation in three ways, by emailing live at duke.edu, visiting the Duke University Facebook page, or using the Twitter tag, Duke Live. Professor Neal, we're here at your office hours. We're talking about the legacy of Michael Jackson. He would have been turning 51 tomorrow, but instead his family is preparing to lay him to rest next week. Now, the news about Michael Jackson these days is very much speculations about his death and the fate of his estate. How much do these things really matter in terms of his overall legacy? I think they're a great conversation now. You know, when you think about Michael Jackson as intellectual property, for instance, uh, when you think about the, the circumstances of his death, I mean, I, I think it makes great news fodder now. But I think 10 years from now, we're just going to be left with the conversation about how great the music was, how great a performer he was, um, and what kind of, you know, path that he laid, you know, first as a child and then as an adult, you know, for so many artists in so many different arenas, you know, to do some wonderful things. I think ultimately that's the legacy. You know, the stuff that we deal with now, you know, is the stuff that we kind of expect. You know, he died under... Uh, questionable circumstances and everybody's wondering where all the money is going to go and of course you know it's a whole bunch of money um, so I, I'm not surprised that's where the conversation is now but but hopefully once Michael is literally laid to rest um, you know we can get back to the business of thinking about his legacy within the context of American culture very good when you write about Michael Jackson in your essay for the hello world Motown CD compilation you say it would be a lot to suggest that a young black boy from the city of Geary, Indiana deserves recognition for the easing of racial tensions in the early 70s. But when the young man galvanized an unprecedented audience of multicultural America a decade later, there is little question that for so many of us growing up on the Jackson 5 and not privy to the bitter racial disputes of our parents and grandparents, Michael Jackson was a sign of possibilities. Talk to us about those possibilities. You know, when you go back to the early days with, with Michael and his brothers, you know, the symbols of black nationalism and black militancy in the, in the late 1960s, you know, Afros and, and, and black power fist and, you know, all kinds of, of things that suggested that a, a real shift had occurred in terms of black America. You know, you weren't seeing the generation before that it was a new generation taking over. So there was something that was significant about the fact that you had these five black boys from Gary, Indiana, with their afros and, and with their little vests with the little suede fringes on it and all this kind of stuff, that, that they were able to capture America the way that they did. I mean, their success in that regard, yeah, we can look at Sammy Davis Jr. and the kind of success he had both as a child and then as a young adult. But when you think about these five brothers, you know, and, and them being piped into America's living rooms and onto their radios and on their record players and, you know, Jackson 5 singles on the back of, of cereal boxes. You know, this was something that was unprecedented in, in, in America at this point in time. You know, they had a Saturday morning cartoon. I mean, how many folks could say that, you know, they were so popular that you could watch a cartoon of me, you know, at some point. But I think it was important because I, I know for me, for my generation, and Michael's just a few years older than me. You know, when I saw a young Michael Jackson, when I saw a young Jermaine Jackson, when I saw, you know, those brothers on television, you know, it told me as a four, five, six year old child that I, I could do this, right? That there are lots of things that I could imagine. You know, my parents couldn't imagine the world that the Jackson Five, you know, were beginning to create for their their son, you know, at that period in time. And I think when you start to see his great success in the early 1980s, you know, when he becomes the, the ultimate crossover musical artist, at least, you know, you had a generation of folks who remembered Michael Jackson and remembered the Jackson Five when they were children, and and all the possibilities of this sudden multicultural presence that Mike, Michael Jackson represented. You, we saw the full uh, e expression of that, you know, in terms of Thriller and his great successes in the 1980s. I mean, what that said, you know, I think for many folks, black, white, 
Latino, Asian America, what have you, is that there, there really were not limits, right? There were going to be difficulties, right? There were going to be, you know, things placed in our way that would make us difficult to do the kind of things that we wanted to do. But Michael Jackson and the Jackson Five are proof that, you know, those things, in fact, could be done. You know, no one could have expected these, this family, you know, the nine of them living in this house in Gary, Indiana, working class. No one would expect that 20 years later that, that Michael Jackson would be the very epitome of crossover mainstream success. Okay, and as we talk about Michael Jackson and his legacy, it's hard to do it without hearing his music. <laughs> and uh, you point to a song, uh, Can You Remember, a Jackson 5 song. Yeah. So let's yeah. see if we can't listen to a little bit about that and then, and then talk about where it fits in. Okay. So this is a Jackson 5 song, Can You Remember? Not one of Michael Jackson's <laughs> most famous, but you say it's important. Why is that, Professor? Well, Hall? you know, first and foremost, it's a Delphonic song, right? Lead singer William Hart, you know, written by the legendary Tom Bell, who, you know, four or five years after that would, great, would write and produce great songs for the Spinners, would write and produce great songs for the Stylistics, would be part of the Mighty Three, you know, Tom Bell, uh, Kenny Gamble, Leon Huff, they created that great, rich Philadelphia soul sound of the 1970s. And, and Tom Bell is, is really trying things on in 1967, 1968, when he starts to work with the Delphonics. And, you know, for the Jackson 5 in those early days, you know, the person who was really putting them through the paces is, is, is a great Motown story, a guy by the name of Bobby Taylor. He recorded himself with the group Bobby Taylor and the Vancouver's. And, and he was the one who really put Michael Jackson and the Jackson 5 through their paces. And, and he saw them, you know, as my friend Harry Weinger talks about, as little soul men, right? Bobby Taylor hoped that this young group of young men, you know, these five black young men from Gary, Indiana, would be exemplars of this kind of soul man tradition, right? So he had them record these songs. So Michael Jackson, as early as nine or 10 years old, you know, you ask him who his favorite singer was. And he was like, you know, yeah, I love Jackie Wilson, right? And I love James Brown, but I really love William Hart. Um, and so this was a chance, and they recorded many Tom Bell recordings in those early years, and, and a few other Delphonic songs, La 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 Means I Love You, from the ABC album. But I think, you know, this captures here as this 10-year-old boy, Michael Jackson is not just a performer, not just a singer, but already developing as an archivist, right, of, of the soul music tradition. So much so that at 10 years old, when most kids have no idea who William Hart and, you know, and the Delphonics are, you know, that's his favorite group. And, and you hear it in the song. And, you know, I love the song simply because it, it just captures a certain kind of nostalgia for the era, you know. You know, can you remember when we were children? And, and it's really hard for me, particularly after his death, not to think about Michael Jackson and think very seriously about, you know, what were the best moments of my own childhood. And I think a lot of folks had that same experience, you know, with Michael Jackson. Very good. Viewers can join this Duke Office Hours conversation in three ways by emailing live at duke.edu, visiting the Duke University Facebook page, or using the Twitter tag, Duke Live. Professor Neal, let's fast forward here in the life of Michael Jackson, and you've brought another song. It's uh, Don't Stop Until You Get Enough. Let's take a listen <coughs> to that, and then, and then talk about what happened between these two, first two songs. But you could keep on because the force it, it's got a lot of power and it, it makes me feel like it, it, it makes me feel like it. Okay, this is Michael Jackson's Don't Stop Until You Get Enough. Professor Neal, talk to us. What happened in the interim between Can You Remember and Don't Stop Till You Get Enough? Lots of things. The Jackson 5 became an incredible child act. Motown struggled to figure out what to do with them. And as the boys were growing up, and, and they wanted not only to reflect the fact that they were now teenagers and young adults, they wanted to record music that reflected the world that they were living in. You know, Motown's strategy was to keep them children, you know, as little boys as long as possible. And, you know, once the hit stopped happening, right, you know, once Michael's voice changed and, and they start to want to take more direction in their career, you find there's a period of time where, you know, the Jackson 5 sound is kind of lost, and, and inevitably the group decides, you 
you know, to leave Motown, the place that, you know, began their career and they move on to the Epic label. And, and their first two recordings are produced by Gamble and Huff. You know, again, that kind of love for the Philadelphia soul sound. And this is when the group, you know, themselves become much more mature in terms of their singing, the way they think about music. They start to write their own songs. In fact, you know, they produced their first album, Destiny, in 1978, you know, to give them some sense of that maturity. And for Michael, you know, it's about growing up. It's about feeling a sense of his own self. He's living in New York. You know, his friendship with Diana Ross really begins to blossom. He He's stu hitting Studio 654, you know, in the evening. And, and, of course, the great breakthrough is when he's cast as, as the Scarecrow, you know, in The Wiz and his introduction to Quincy Jones. And he began seriously to think about a new direction in his career. And, and, and after doing four solo albums for Motown, you know, the last two of which were largely forgotten, you know, he makes his transition as a new solo artist and, and, and releases Off the Wall. And, you know, I, I have a generational bias. You know, when I ask folks, what's your favorite Michael Jackson album? And, and folks are like, no, it's Thriller, it's Thriller. It's like, okay, Thriller was great. But if you say Thriller was the best Michael Jackson album, you know, for me, that means that, you know, you came, you were Johnny come lately to Michael Jackson, right? That if you had been following Michael Jackson's career from the beginning, you know, that, you know, his most incredible artistic statement was, in fact, off the wall. And, and that opening single, first side of off the wall, you know, don't stop till you get enough. I mean, just the sheer energy of the song, right? You know, it's it, it's my We Fit song. You know, when I'm doing that little 10 minute step thing, free step thing, you know, I'm listening to Michael Jackson's Don't Stop Till You Get Enough. And, it, you know, it resonates continually in the culture. You know, Mary J. Blind, you know, her great single from a few years ago, So Fine, was in part a homage to that video for Don't Stop Till You Get Enough and, and also to the song. And it was this great moment, you know, where Mary J. Blige is performing So Fine on the Today Show. You know, David Gregory is a guest host that day. And the camera pans back and, and you see David Gregory, you know, all six foot five of him doing his little spin move dancing to Mary J. Blige. And, and, and what I see in that moment is the influence not not simply of a great R&B singer in terms of Mary J. Blige, but also, you know, the more global, you know, influence of someone like, like Michael Jackson. And I think, you know, if, if I'm looking to make an introduction to the adult Michael Jackson, so you can get a feeling for why he was so fantastic in the energy of his music, I'm putting Don't Stop Till You Get Enough on every time. You know, one of my favorite moments of the last year uh, was being at the, the Root uh, magazine that I write for, online magazine. Uh, a collaboration with the Washington Post. I mean, they held a, a wonderful inaugural ball, you know, in D.C. before the inauguration, hosted by Henry Louis Gates, Skip Gates. Um, and Bismarcky, the rapper, uh, was the DJ for the evening. And it was a moment where Bismarcky puts back to back, you know, let's don't stop till you get enough. And Michael Jackson's want to be starting something. And, you know, this kind of energy and community that came out of this moment, you know, it's something that I'll never forget for the rest of my life. Very good. Viewers can join this Duke Office Hours conversation in three ways. By emailing live at duke.edu, visiting the Duke University Facebook page, or using the Twitter tag Duke Live. We've got a question by email here from a minister, Paul Scott. And he writes, Dear Dr. Neal, uh, about five years ago, Michael Jackson became more of a political activist and started calling out the major players in the industry by name who exploited back black talent. Your thoughts? You know, it's an interesting discussion, right? And, and thank you, Minister Scott, for that question. Um, you know, Michael Jackson, we, we've always thought about him for a long time as, as kind of being the man-child that was divorced from what was happening in the world. You know, I mentioned earlier the kind of sh struggles that the family had with the Motown label in the 70s, you know, them wanting to do music that spoke to a certain kind of social consciousness that, that reflected the world that they were living in. So there were always those tensions. And, and Michael, you know, while he obviously is trying to sell as many records as possible, found his own way to be political. You know, Man in the Mirror, Mirror I think, was an incredibly political song. You know, the great song that he does at the beginning of Spike Lee's Get on the Bus, um, you know, his contribution to that film, a film that was produced by 15 black men, um, you know, he had his own way of being political. And of course, for we, for years, while we questioned the changes in his face and questioned, you know, his love of blackness, the fact of the matter is that, you know, he was regularly writing checks for, you know, for black institutions and black concerns throughout his life. But I think at this particular moment, you know, he begins to call into question the reality of the music industry, right? And it's not just Michael Jackson. You know, one of the best critiques of the recording industry came from Courtney Love. You know, Courtney Love about, you know, nine years ago was asked about the music recording industry and she said, 
said it's sharecropping. And, it, you know, you have to wonder, what does this young white woman know about sharecropping to apply it to the reality, to the recording industry? But she was dead on, right? The, the average artist will sign a contract that basically guarantees them about 7% of all the royalties generated from their music, um, seven cents on the dollar. And, you know, when you think about artists that are together in a group and you're talking about, you know, five or six people in the group of producers sharing this 7%, you can understand why in the case of groups like TLC, you know, they could have sell three, four, five million records and at the same time, you know, file for bankruptcy. And I think Michael Jackson, despite all the wealth that he had generated from the recording industry, you know, tried to have this conversation. And I think part of the reason why the conversation didn't get a foothold at that point in time, because many folks found it hard to believe that Michael Jackson, of all folks, you know, would be questioning the exploitation of artists in the context of the recording industry. Okay, you're, Professor Neal, you're speaking here about Michael Jackson in some pretty uh, grand terms, a uh, cultural, political <coughs> figure. And in the New York Times essay that you wrote about him, you said that he was a coalescing symbol of global unity, uh, a global community. On the other hand, he, he's also the king of pop, and his lyrics are, are decidedly pop. Uh, how do you square those two things? Michael Jackson, the entertainer, and Michael Jackson political cultural figure. I mean, you could argue that Michael Jackson was the internet before the internet, um, you know, as a way of kind of a symbol of a global community. Uh, uh, you know, I, I'd like to think of Michael Jackson as a lingua, the lingua franca, <laughs> you know, of his era, you know, the common speak, you know, everybody's like, you know, what do we have in common? We got Michael Jackson in common. And, and I think that's very real. Um, but, you know, he is a pop star. And I, I think, you know, he found a fine line between you know, on the one hand, representing the best of African-American culture, right? And, and there's no way to hear and see Michael Jackson at his peak and not have to sit down and have a conversation about the James Browns and Jackie Wilsons and Sammy Davis Juniors of the world, you know, the Tom Bells of the world. I mean, all these incredible figures that, that you know, he channeled, you know, in his performance, Honey Coles. I mean, we could just go on and on. Uh, about this. But at the same time, he is a pop star and he's trying to reach a, a pop audience. And I think, you know, there's always these kind of expectations that we have, you know, uh, about celebrities and their ability to impact political issues. Um, I, I think that's always limited. You know, people don't listen to music because, you know, they want to find a blueprint for revolution. People don't listen to music because they want to be educated about the prison industrial complex. People listen to music because music is something that they do in their leisure, you know, leisure broadly defined. And I think Michael Jackson as a pop star, you know, was the best of what pop culture represented for, for a period of time. And I think, you know, whatever politics that we can read in that, you know, in terms of the way that he brings down barriers, particularly in terms of mainstream popular culture and, and music video, I mean, those things are very real. You know, was he motivated by some sort of notion that he was fueled by the success of the civil rights movement and he had a responsibility to live up to those expectations? I, mean, I, I don't think we know. I think ultimately he wanted to get his music played on MTV and push down boundaries that allow us, you know, at that point in time, at least to hear Lionel Richie and Whitney Houston and, and Eddie Grant, you know, singing Electric Avenue and, and, and that kind of stuff. Um, it, I, I think there's always the risk of taking pop figures and making them too significant politically. Uh, but when you consider Michael Jackson's global appeal, um, I, I think it's not that far-fetched to consider that he did re have very real social and political implications in terms of his success. Okay, viewers can join this Duke Office Hours conversation in three ways. By emailing live at duke.edu, visiting the Duke University Facebook page, or using the Twitter tag, Duke Live. We've got a question by email here from Camille, who says, Al Sharpton said that there would be no President Barack Obama without Michael Jackson. Are there other firsts that Michael Jackson influenced? Professor Neal. Well, we, you know, we talked about the MTV thing. You know, when we go back and, and, you know, when I talk to my students about this, I mean, they find it hard to believe. You know, MTV, you know, is a place where you find all kinds of stuff now, you know, everything except music videos, really. You know, but when it, the channel was founded, you know, some, some years ago, uh, you know, I, I've always described it as the very definition of cultural apartheid in the United States. Uh, you know, they made a very clear claim, you know, this is, 
a station that is network that is devoted to playing rock music and black people don't play rock music and of course you know we could talk about Jimi Hendrix we could talk about Mother's Finest you know which would have been in their prime we could talk about Bad Brains and later we can talk about Fishbone and Living Color and a range of other folks um, you know clearly there are black folks who had playing that were playing music within that particular genre um, but you know basically what MTV was saying is that we're not interested in R&B and soul performance right you know we're we're looking for a certain kind of music. And Michael Jackson, along with Quincy Jones and the head of CBS at the time, Walter Yitnikoff, you know, they, they challenged, you know, MTV and said, you know, Michael Jackson is selling the most records in America. How can you not play his music? You know, how can you not play Billie Jean? It's at, at the top of the charts. How can you not play Beat It? It's at the top of the charts. And, and, and to MTV's credit, you know, they realized that it was a good business decision. So, I mean, so that's the obvious case of the kind of Michael Jackson first. But to get to the point about, you know, what Reverend Sharpton said about Michael Jackson, I mean, the 1980s is, is such a critical moment in terms of, you know, the fusing of a certain kind of multicultural sensibility and, and, and the bringing down of certain racial boundaries. Um, you really can't talk about Barack Obama being elected in November 2008 without talking about Michael Jackson. But you also talk about, you know, the Cosby Show. You also talk about Eddie Murphy. Um, you know, their successes, you know, were very much like you know, the first black family that moves into a white neighborhood, you know, who had the responsibility of, of making their white neighbors comfortable with their presence. Michael Jackson and Eddie Murphy, um, Bill Cosby, you know, probably even more profoundly than those two, you know, made white America comfortable with the presence of black folks in the mainstream. Um, you know, and, and when you look at Barack Obama's election, I mean, he's a product of that particular moment. Great. Professor Neal, we've got another question by email. This one comes from Tammy. She writes, Dr. Neal, what are your thoughts on the relationship between Michael Jackson and the black community, both during his life and in the weeks after his death? I, I think his relationship to the black community is very complicated um, for lots of reasons, right? I mean, just in terms of the sheer politics of the recording industry, when Michael Jackson eventually moves and the Jackson 5 move from Motown to, to Sony, you know, they're being handled by the black music division. Um, when Michael Jackson breaks through with Off the Wall and begin and then breaks through with Thriller, you know, he's not handled by the black music division anymore, right? He's, he's handled by the pop division. Um, so Michael Jackson, just in terms of how he was being serviced to radio, how he's being serviced to video, I, I mean, he, the companies are making decisions about who he's going to sit down and have an interview with. It. So we're very early in his career, Michael Jackson is sitting down and spending, you know, 35 minutes with Frankie Crocker on black-owned WBLS in New York. You know, in the 1980s, he's spending that half an hour with Kurt Loder and MTV. And I think for many bl in the black community, they saw that, that somehow his presence was being removed, right? And we've had the same conversation even recently about contemporary hip hop artists, right, who, who no longer seem to have a presence within black media, you know, because they become mainstream stars. But I don't think there was ever a point where Michael Jackson ever forgot or, or, or didn't remember the black community that he came from. Um, I think he had to think very differently about his blackness and think very differently about race to maintain the level of success that he had. Um, and we can question some of the choices he's made in terms of self-mutilation or, you know, is it masking or whatever we wanted to call it. Um, but again, you know, he's always writing those checks to the United Negro College Fund. His body of work always spoke powerfully Right to the to an African American aesthetic that informed his art from the beginning and informed his art to the end. You know, at the same time that he's going through all his kind of criminal crisis over the last, you know, few years of his life, he is in regular conversation with figures like Al Sharpton and Jesse Jackson and Louis Farrakhan. You know, you know, it's Louis Farrakhan and Nation of Islam and the fruit of Islam that are given Michael Jackson protection, you know, during his trial back in 2003. And this is the same Louis Farrakhan who just 19 years earlier, you know, railed against Michael Jackson, right, as being the epitome of everything that was wrong with black masculinity in America, right? So, you know, they were having a public dispute in 1984, but that never meant that they didn't see themselves as part of a black community that could have publicly have an argument and a difference, but at the same time, close ranks around folks. And, and I think you saw during the 2003 trial, you know, after 
Michael Jackson, on some level, had dismissed the black community as being relevant, you know, to his life and his career, you did see the black community, in fact, close ranks around him. And you saw it again after his death, you know, when so many people wanted to talk about, you know, the criminal charges against him and all the questions about pedophilia. You know, what you saw was a black community that remembered that Michael Jackson as a little boy who was literally the prettiest Negro they had never, ever seen, you know, when he was nine and ten years old. And, and I think that was an important balance to the way that we thought about Michael Jackson and his death. Very good. Viewers can join this Duke Office Hours conversation in three ways. By emailing live at duke.edu, visiting the Duke University Facebook page, or using the Twitter tag Duke Live. Professor Neil, you mentioned Louis Farrakhan and the dialogue with Michael Jackson. Let's bring in your concept of emerging new black man. Explain that and, and how it fits with Michael Jackson. You know, the, the thing that's interesting about Michael Jackson's performance of masculinity, um, and, and many folks have talked about his androgyny, but if you look at his most popular black male R&B peers from the early 1980s, um, Luther Vandross, you know, for which the, there was always tremendous ambiguity about his sexuality, rampant rumors about his homosexuality. You look at Prince, um, who arguably, you know, trafficked in androgyny um, even more so, you know, than Michael Jackson. And even somebody like Mick, Rick James, who, you know, we never think about in this context, but, you know, in 1980, this is a grown black man wearing braids with glitter. Um, and, and if you look at their peers, even in rock music, I mean, the beginning of the video age was an era in which the performance of masculinity across the board, you know, very often engaged in different forms of androgyny. Um, and I think Michael Jackson was part of that, right? And as Michael Jackson clearly was working through issues around racial identity um, and kind of melding race together, he also played significantly, obviously, with gender. You know, he would perform certain kinds of hyper-masculine, uh, you know, hyper-masculine performance to make certain kinds of points. You know, the video for Remember the Time and, you know, the kiss with, a, with the model of mom, you know, that was him, you know, articulating a certain kind of black masculinity. But at the same time, he really was playing with the idea. And, and I think it raises interesting questions about how we thought about black masculinity in that era. You know, black masculinity in the early 1980s, which is coming out of the era of a certain kind of hyper-masculine performance. When you think about Richard Roundtree as Shaft, when you think about the music of Isaac Hayes, when you think about, you know, Marvin Gaye's music, I mean, this, this performance of hyper-masculinity, the same stuff that we're seeing in black exploitation films like Shaft and Truck Turner and a range of these other images. And Michael Jackson comes along and, and, and really softens that image. And, and I wouldn't say that it's about softening black masculinity, but really opening up this place of black masculinity for, for mon more complex, um, performances that, that engage in performances of femininity, that engage in performances of androgyny, right? And I think it becomes a very pregnant and productive cultural and creative space that black artists are able to tap into. Um, you know, the, the elephant in the room during this era is a figure like Sylvester. You know, I'm teaching, you know, Joshua Gamson's uh, biography of Sylvester this semester uh, in my class, autobiography, uh, rhythm and autobiography. And, you know, part of what we're trying to deal with is to look at, you know, here you have this very, very open black man, Sylvester, you know, who's coming out of the Bay Area, is very clear about his homosexuality, is very clear about his drag performances, and making a distinct claim, you know, that he is a part of the same tradition that produces the Marvin Gaye's and the Barry Whites. I mean, some of, uh, you know, Sylvester's most successful recordings from the late 1970s were recorded by Harry Fuqua, you know, one-time member of the Moon glows, close friend of Marvin Gaye. In fact, he's the one who brings Marvin Gaye to Motown. Right, so Sylvester in this very gay performance, right, is very clear. I am part of this tradition. And I think Michael Jackson and the way that he performs androgyny, again, along with figures like Prince and, 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 and Rick James from that era, you know, Jermaine Stewart, uh, a name that we don't hear enough these days, you know, in terms of the great music he did, dance music he did in the 80s. You know, I think he was charting some important ground for us to rethink black masculinity. Viewers can join this Duke Office Hours conversation in three ways. By emailing live at duke.edu, visiting the Duke University Facebook page, or using the Twitter tag DukeLive. We have an email question here from Jasmine. She writes, 
Can Professor Neal talk about how Michael Jackson's artistry was affected by the trials and becoming a punchline due to the changes in his skin, hair, Bubbles the Chimp, etc.? Did these things affect the music he created, Professor Neal? <coughs> I think they obviously did, and, and I think in, in very significant and different ways. You know, you got to remember when you look at Thriller, this is an album that sells 29 million copies here in the United States, um, almost 10 times that globally, right? And once you go out one day and you sell 29 million records, you know, the question becomes, you know, what do you do next? How do you follow that up? And I think Michael Jackson, you know, because he had become a perfectionist, right? I mean, Thriller was a product of a period of time, you know, he felt as though, you know, Off the Wall, which I think he may even believe was a better album. I think he thought the kind of critical acclaim that, that he thought Off the Wall deserved, he didn't get it. And, and so he went back to work with Thriller with the idea that people weren't going to be able to ignore Michael Jackson. And I think once he set that standard around perfection, you know, it became very difficult to do the thing that he did all the time in Motown. And Motown with the Jackson 5, I mean, they were in the studio every day. You know, I'm privileged now to be, you know, listening to, you know, rarities and, and, and outtakes, you know, stuff that's going to be released that had been sitting in the cans now for, for three decades. I mean, he was in the studio all the time. You know, as he got older, and given to this certain notion of perfection, you know, one of the things I think that undermined Michael Jackson's career and made it easy for us to no longer think him to be serious as an artist anymore is that when you look at the body of work from, say, the release of Bad in 1987 to the end of his career, there's just simply not a lot of music there. And where most of his contemporaries and peers were trying to get new recordings out, you know, every other year, if you're a rapper, you were trying to get an album out every year, you know, Michael Jackson was taking five or six, seven years between projects. And, and that meant a couple of things. It meant, on the one hand, he was recording music that just by definition could no longer be relevant to the changing shifts and the shifts in taste and everything that takes place in the music industry, where what's hot, you know, in 2007 is passe in 2009. And, and artists forget about, you know, you forget about artists. And, and so Michael Jackson, the freak show, because there was no music for us to consume, because there was no music for us to dance to, make love to, et cetera, et cetera, Michael Jackson, the freak, freak show becomes the primary focus of Michael Jackson's career. So that even when Michael Jackson is thinking about making comebacks, you know, when you think about the album, you know, that he did in 2001, which, you know, produces what I think is his last great single, uh, Butterflies. Um, you know, when you think about that kind of music, when he makes that comeback, folks are like, you know, we don't care about Michael Jackson anymore. You know, he was great 20 years ago. What is he doing for us now? Um, and so I think in that regard, you know, all the focus on the criminal trials and, and, and the excesses and, and, you know, what was earlier in his career, his decision, right, to present a kind of freakish take on himself so that he would always be commercially relevant, I think that kind of stuff undermines his credibility as an artist. We've got another question here. This one comes by email from Stuart, and he writes, Dr. Neal, in the past you've talked about anti-gay hip-hop lyrics, and it's puzzling that the black church is so much more conservative on same-sex marriage than it is on other divisive issues such as abortion. Today, are you seeing any shift in black social conservatism? <laughs> You know, I think it depends on where the conversation is being had. I think it depends on, on where you're at. You know, I think there have for a long time been examples of, of black, progressive black churches um, that they're progressive in, in lots of ways, right? In terms of a dress code within churches that makes it comfortable for anybody to find a home in the church. But obviously along the lines of, you know, what's happening in terms of, of, of black religious institutions. Um, you know, one of the great interesting stories, for instance, of Motown uh, is an artist by the name of Carl Bean. Um, Carl Bean, who now is, is a bishop um, in a church in Los Angeles that explicitly embraces, you know, a same-sex presence. Um, there was uh, some focus on the church and, and Marlon Riggs' great documentary, Black Is, Black Ain't. But 30 years ago, Carl Bean, you know, was a disco singer you know, who released a 12-inch disco single for Motown called I Was Born This Way, you know, making an explicit claim, you know, about his homosexuality and the value of homosexuality in the world. 
And I think, you know, it's an interesting moment, you know, that this figure is on the dance floor in 1977, but in 2009, you know, he, he's in the church. So I think we clearly have seen certain kinds of shifts and, and more progressive things. But, you know, when you think about the influence of what I like to call the Black Bible Belt, right, and I'm not talking about a geographical space, but really kind of a cultural movement, a philosophical movement, you know, where much of the gatekeeping that takes place within the black community often is taking place within the context of black religious institutions that are having incredible power, you know, in 2009 in terms of dictating, you know, what the face of black America should look like, right? And, and it's not to say that there hasn't always been an influence of the black church in terms of black social thought and, and the black community. I mean, that's clearly the case. I mean, that's what the civil rights movement is. But I'm talking about a, a very distinct conservative strain uh, of black religious thought, you know, that, that really is dictating conversations about same-sex marriage, that's dictating conversations about young men wearing sagging pants and, and a range of issues. Uh, and I think we need to take it seriously. I mean, when you look at the success of Tyler Perry, um, I mean, he's the best example of this. Tyler Perry is a fascinating figure at this point in time because on the one hand, you know, you give him props for his successes, right? This is someone who understood the idea of branding and he did what no one had been able to do for 30 years to get black church populations to go into the theater and watch Hollywood films, right? And he's been rewarded for those successes, right? The two television shows, the success of all his films. But when you look at Tyler Perry's movement, movies, right? I mean, they basically reflect a very conservative idea around political and social thought within the black community in terms of gender and the role that women should play. Right? The idea that women should not think themselves as being more important than the men in their career and that there should be limits in terms of how, what their successes are and they should never put those successes out there in the world. You know, one of the most striking moments I've had over the last three years, you know, doing the kind of work that I do was going to see Taylor, uh, Tyler Perry's film, The Family That Prays. Um, and that scene in the film where the husband realizes that his wife has been cheating on him, that his son is not his son, you know, and, and he smacks, um, you know, the woman across a lunch counter. And there were people in the theater where I went to saw the film that stood up and, and clapped, standing ovation. That's like, whoa, this is serious, right? And part of what this question is suggesting is that, you know, while there is clearly a more progressive ring among you know black social thought and black political and religious thought within the black community there still is a significant conservative strain that i think you know those of us who do the kind of work that i do uh, are very conscious of and trying to do whatever we can you know to speak back to we have two more questions here for you professor neil they both come from twitter about michael jackson's turbulent life quirky black girl asks just thinking about how histories of abuse can lead to more abuse abuse of others, less powerful, and of drugs. So that's, uh, I guess there's a question there. Reflections on Michael Jackson and abuse and drugs in his life. You know, that's, that's what I'll call the, I, I assume, the, the Joe Jackson question. Um, you know, Joe Jackson, and, and you know, Joe Jackson hasn't done much uh, to rehabilitate his image, in, you know, in, in the weeks after his son's death. Uh, probably worse, you know, three nights after his son's death, you know, at, at the BET Awards. But, you know, Joe Jackson, you know, not to read him as some, somehow outside of anything, you know, he's of a particular generation of black men, um, black fathers, black parents in general, um, that were very serious about keeping their kids on the straight and narrow and were very clear about the idea that violence was an important aspect of keeping them in a straight and narrow. And I think we need to put this in a particular context, right? You know, you're talking about a period of time that Joe Jackson came through in American society where young black boys, for instance, you know, if they looked at a white woman the wrong way, I mean, this is the Emmett Till narrative, right? That if they looked at a white woman the wrong way, if they engaged in what, you know, it was known at the time as reckless eyeballing, right? as a 13 or 14 or even as a 10 year old kid. I mean, that's the kind of stuff that could get you killed. And I think many parents at the time were particularly harsh, right? In, in terms of keeping their kids on the straight and narrow because they wanted to make sure that when their kids left the house in, during the day to go to school, that they made it home at night. And, and sometimes the lash was going to be the most effective way to keep their children alive, right? But not to excuse that. I mean, that's just to put that in a particular context. And, you know, Joe Jackson was a product of that kind of moment. And again, he has all these kids, you know, and they're trying to keep it all together. And he realized that he had 
had some they had some skills and talents and one of the best ways that he could keep them focused on their skill and talent you know was to have a certain level of discipline and and clearly you know he thought violence was one of the ways to maintain that discipline and I think, you know, in the case of Michael Jackson, I think, you know, his whole life was about trying to come to terms with how he in particular dealt with and engaged the violence, right, and associated with his disciplining as a child. And I think, you know, one of the things you see that has been very touching in reflections of Michael Jackson, particularly in his later years, is that as a parent, he was very much so concerned about those kinds of issues that, you know, he was really thinking about an alternative narrative in terms of his own parenting. You know, and of course, you know, the abuse of drugs, narcotics, and, and, and a range of other things. You know, you know, Michael Jackson is someone who part of his genius was this idea that he pushed his bo body beyond what we thought were real physical boundaries and limitations. You know, at some point there's a price to pay for that, you know, and, and so that when he starts to engage in painkillers and all these other kinds of issues, I mean, it, it clearly was a, a very quick and slippery slope and, and I think you know the sad part of that is that you know Michael Jackson was not surrounded by enough people right who really could get into the mix and, and push back right I mean he basically was surrounded by enablers you know who basically followed all his direction and, and, and ultimately I think that ends you know that becomes part of his ultimate demise. Viewers can join this Duke Office Hours conversation in three ways by emailing live at duke.edu visiting the Duke University Facebook page, or using the Twitter tag, Duke Live. We've got a question from Twitter here from FP Jr. And he asked, Dr. Neal, predict the future. Can Michael's polished legacy outlast his tabloid woes? Thank you, Frank. Um, I, I think they will. I mean, part of it is that, you know, just some of the music is, is so fantastic. Um, and it's creating, you know, his death has created a new moment, you know, for folks to think about his music, a new generation to engage, you know, his music. Um, you know, my two daughters, who are 11 and 6, my, my oldest, in fact, shares a birthday with Michael Jackson tomorrow. Um, you know, this last eight weeks, you know, six weeks has been this opportunity for them to really engage Michael Jackson in his music le musical legacy on their own terms, right? To have their own favorite songs and not have their favorite Michael Jackson song, you know, be dictated by what their father's listening to in the car all the time. And I think there are many of these stories. I mean, one of the things that happens with Michael Jackson's death that I think, you know, bears kind of remarking on is that, you know, had he died 10 years ago, the ability for record company, for his record company, to get Michael Jackson product out there would have been very difficult, right? Because we now have a digital technology that makes music available in a form that's easy to access and you don't have to worry about distribution and production, you know, it's allowed for Michael Jackson's music to be accessed in all kinds of new ways. And, and that's been borne out in terms of the number of record sales, right? I mean, some 10 million Michael Jackson records have been sold, more than that, have been sold, you know, since his death. And I think that would have been virtually impossible 10 years ago just simply because of the production mechanisms that were in place. You know, so one of my favorite recordings these days is, is the Michael Jackson Strip Project, you know, where they take Michael Jackson and Jackson 5 vocals and strip down the music in the background. And these are songs, you know, one of my favorite Jackson 5 songs is a song called Darling Dear. Uh, last track on their third album, a song that was written and originally recorded by Smokey Robinson. Um, and so I'm listening to this song, I mean, literally a song that I've been listening to for 40 years. And with this strip version, I'm hearing elements of his vocals and instrumentation and arrangement that I had never heard before, right? So I think, you know, the future legacy of Michael Jackson for is that it's gonna be immense, right? His, the stuff of his, you know, as an adult that remains in the can, the stuff of his that was done in Motown, you know, that's in the can, some of which will be released by the end of the year. You know, I've been fortunate to, to work on many projects, you know, through my friend Harry Weinger at Universal in terms of reissues. So we've been doing this stuff around, you know, these Jackson 5 rarities. And one of the fabulous, most fabulous things I've heard in the last week or two is a song that Michael Jackson did with Stevie Wonder. Stevie Wonder produced, it's about 74, 75. It's a song called Buttercup. 
and you know there were long rumors in the late in the mid 1970s that Stevie Wonder was going to produce a whole Jackson Five album. The Jackson Five, um, for instance, seen background vocals on Stevie's "You Haven't Done no Nothing." You know the do do up. Ho, 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 do, you know, that's a Jackson 5 in the background. And so Stevie starts to work with them, and this track, Buttercup, you know, when you hear the song, when you hear the maturity of Michael Jackson's voice, it's literally a song that sounds like it had to be recorded five years later, you know, when he records Off the Wall. And in fact, you know, Stevie Wonder contributes a song, I Can't Help It, to Off the Wall, and they very much sound alike. But this is the kind of stuff about Michael Jackson's legacy that's still out there and, and will be able to consume so much of it, you know, in, in, in the near future. And I think it would only embolden our sense of, of how incredible Michael Jackson's musical legacy is. Professor Neal, you've mentioned some personal connections here to Michael Jackson, and you've even written, Michael Jackson was my childhood. So talk about this intersection of your own personal history showing up in your academic life. I was joking with my students the other night, uh, you know, about my man crush on Jay-Z. Um, you know, as, as, as a child, I clearly had a boy crush on, on Michael Jackson. Um, you know, when you listen to Michael Jackson sing, Who's Loving You? Right? You know, this is a nine, ten-year-old boy who seems to have knowledge of stuff that he don't suppose to have knowledge of. Uh, but for me growing up and, and trying to imagine myself in the world, right, and how to function in the world and looking for role models who look like me, the most prominent role model for me was Michael Jackson, right? You know, the haircut, the Applejack hat, you know, that the cover of the Got to Be There album, right, where he has like the little suede jacket on and all that. I, I, I think I modeled a lot of that, right? You know, when I first started having, you know, little romantic inklings with some of the little girls in my class, you know, and I didn't quite yet have the language myself, you know, to tell them how I felt about them. I, you know, I would transcribe Michael Jackson lyrics, right, and send them little notes, you know, got to be there, darling dear, you know, all that kind of stuff. We got a good thing going. Um, you know, for me, Michael Jackson is a very personal thing, right, and, and a very personal connection to, to my childhood, obviously. Um, and I think, you know, I've been very fortunate in, in my professional career you know, to be able to have the privilege to write about him, you know, both in terms of his great successes, but also in very personal ways. Uh, and particularly this last year and a half, being able to work, you know, with Universal, you know, in, in terms of writing uh, Michael Jackson's legacy within the context of reissues and, and music. I mean, it, it's been very rewarding and fascinating to me. And I know I'm not the only one, right? I think there are so many of us who came up with the young Michael Jackson in which, you know, Michael Jackson is just such an integral part of our childhoods. Very good. So talk to today's teenager. You mentioned Jay-Z, a uh, more a younger hip-hop artist. If you were to pull the iPod earbud out of uh, today's teenager, what would you tell them about this intersection of the kind of music they love and the life of the mind? You know, this is the thing. Um, when I was growing up, you know, my father was the biggest influence on me in terms of my love of music. You know, working class guy. Uh, short order cook. He himself uh, didn't go to school. He dropped out 10th grade, uh, was quote unquote a functional literate. My father couldn't read. Um, but he had this incredible love of music, right? And, and he passed this on to me. Um, and, and I enjoyed this simply to be in my father's presence on the one hand, right? But the music literally moved me, right? And, and here I came of age going to college and begin graduate school and, and lo and behold this passion that I had for this music you know was something that was translatable in terms of an academic or a scholarly career you know I, I could have never imagined that you know as a six or seven year old boy growing up in the South Bronx 1231 Fulton Avenue with my good friend Joan Morgan living down the down the hallway you know I could have never imagined that stuff you know that some 40 years later you know I, I could have a career talking about how great this music is the influence of the blue political implications. I mean, all these wonderful things. And, you know, what I very often tell my students about, you know, the, the music and culture that they consume is that, you know, yes, it, it is entertainment, right? On a certain level, it's just about having fun and entertainment, but it's also a part of the American cultural legacy, right? And, and serious artists, you know, if they do serious work, we need to take that work serious as artists, as critics, 
as scholars, in some cases simply as fans. And, and, and again, I've been privileged to be able to have a career where I can do a course, for instance, on the, on the films of Spike Lee in the New Black Aesthetic, and on the one hand, you know, enjoy the fact that we get to watch music videos from In Living Color, uh, or the band Living Color, um, or, or the talk about She's Gotta Have It, or, or why Do the Right Thing was so important 20 years after its initial release, um, and at the same time, have younger students, right, younger folks coming after me to develop their own critical sensibilities, you know, as critics, as intellectuals, as scholars, as just everyday thinkers, you know, by consuming this work. Um, so, you know, it's been incredibly rewarding, and, and, and I've been very, felt very thankful and privileged to be able to do this kind of work. And, and, and again, you know, very thankful to my parents, both my mother and dad, for, you know, creating a space for me when I was a child um, that I would find value in culture. Professor Neal, thank you for holding these office hours. You've got one more Michael Jackson song with you here. Yes. It's uh, Want to Be Starting Something. So uh, before we listen to it, mm -hmm. uh, any final words about The King of Pop? You know, I, hopefully all of the controversy about his death will die down and we can actually appreciate his artist, his artistry. I mean, we dealt with many of these same issues, you know, the years immediately after Elvis Presley's death, um, even years after Marilyn Monroe's death. And I think one of the things we get to do now with those figures, even figures like Jimi Hendrix, is that we get to look back at their legacy and, and enjoy what they gave to us. Um, you know, to be an artist is a unique situation. You know, to be a, a big time artist is even more unique. And ultimately, you know, you're giving of yourself, you know, to the world. And I, I think, you know, once we get past all this controversy with Michael, you know, we get to simply enjoy what he gave us uh, all those many years. Very good. The conversation continues online. Email live at duke.edu, visit the Duke University Facebook page, or use the Twitter tag Duke Live. Next week's Office Hours is with Bill Shamidis, Dean of Duke's Nicholas School of the Environment and Earth Sciences. To learn more about Duke, visit duke.edu. So